He's the one that does the growth. No, thank God we've got a pastor who prays the Lord. Because I'm an overachiever, I began to ride Elisha with the Lord. gave the war of God. And, and be a man of God. And they would just, oh, I just want you set free. Christ from the dead lives no, in. No, that this preacher told you the truth. Suggest align yourself with CGIA and let's go forth and take our communities for Christ. Could the earth have been created in just seven days? And where did man come from? Or how old is the earth? Don't miss the Genesis debate at Evangel World Prayer Center June 7th at 5 p.m. All seats are free and doors open at 4 p.m. Plus, you'll have a chance to ask your questions. Defend your belief at the Genesis Debate, Sunday, June 7th at 5 p.m. at the Evangel World Prayer Center. For more information, visit worldprayercenter.org. God will direct you. The Bible says, Be ye not unwise, but understanding. Understand what the will of the Lord is. If we will seek Him, God will show us how to be blessed. God will break off of us whatever the devil has put on us in Jesus' name. Ask and ye shall receive. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. There's power in us to bring healing and miracles and signs and wonders in the name of Jesus. Nothing shall be impossible to us. Nothing shall be withheld from us because we are walking uprightly before the Lord. I break generational curses. I break it in the name of Jesus Christ. May there be a change that takes place for the glory of the Lord. In Jesus' name. Let's give him a great big hand. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Would you, would you stand with me, please, everyone standing? Before we make our confession, I just want to tell you how much it's an honor for me to be your pastor. I would rather be a pastor, the pastor of this church, than any type of wor other work that's available. I, I'd rather be the pastor than a, a, a multi, multi-millionaire. I know I'm right where God's called me in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. And uh, I really believe that God is not only sending a mighty outpouring of His Spirit to this city, but I believe that God is, is going to enable us to do something right in this location that uh, is going to be incredible. Back in 1802, there was a Presbyterian preacher that lived in a house that's located on this property. And there was an Indian fight. And they fought uh, for their survival. And uh, if you go out in some of these, this area here, there's all type of arrowheads and relics. That house is still there. It has a little cemetery. Some of those graves are back in 1801. There's about four or five graves. And I feel like there were men of women of God that prayed over this land. And this land is holy land, and we want to build a school here. Uh, we want to begin to break ground. I have the pictures. I, I'll have them here uh, where you can see them next week. I'm going to bring them right down here and set them up of our new Family Life Center that actually will connect to this building here and it will go all the way across the parking lot and about another 20 feet beyond the parking lot. It'll have gymnasiums in there, it'll have everything for children. Uh, it will be a step down to go to McDonald's or to any of those pl other playgrounds. We'll have uh, things for the youth. It's uh, going to be something that is going to be state of the art and the finest in this city and I know that God is going to enable us and help us our other property that's located over on uh, a miners lane is now listed by the state of Kentucky as one of the properties that would be an outstanding piece of property for our for companies to relocate to Louisville but we want to move everything over to this location, but we're going to have to build a building to handle uh, everything that we're doing. 
So how many be in prayer for us that we can get this thing going right away? Amen? <laughs> Hallelujah. Would you take your Bible today and hold it to the Lord? If you don't have a Bible, hold your hand up. But I want us to make this proclamation. This is the Word of God. This is God's plan for my life. It's a light into my pathway. It's a lamp into my feet. This is a road map for my life. Today I shall hear the Word of God. And faith shall rise in my spirit. And nothing shall be impossible to me. In Jesus' name. As you remain standing, please turn with me to the book of Psalms, chapter 68. If you don't have a Bible, just act like you have a Bible and smile real big. But uh, I want to read this scripture. This is one of the great scriptures in all of the Bible. Psalm 68, 19. Would you say that, please? Psalm 68, 19. It says, Blessed be the Lord who daily, say daily, he daily loadeth us with benefits, even the God of our salvation. Say this with me. Blessed be the Lord, who daily loadeth us with benefits, in Jesus' name. I want you to lift your hands up to the Lord. Holy Spirit, we invite your anointing and power to fall upon every family, upon every young person, upon me. Lord, I pray that you would move mightily in this service, that every need would be met. You'd speak to people while they're here. Lord, I come against every attack in lives and in families. I want you to pray this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of every sin. Cleanse my mind, my hands, the words that I speak. May they be pure words, holy to you. In Jesus' name, amen. I want those who are under a uh, spiritual attack, you're involved in some real spiritual warfare, and it may be with your family, it may be in your finances, but you're in some real spiritual warfare. I want you to remain standing and everyone else be seated. But if you're under some type of attack, a member of your family is, I have a promise from the Lord for you. And it is actually the 17th chapter of 1 Kings. Well, the Lord said to Elijah during the famine, I've prepared a widow in Zarephath to provide for you there. And so when he got to Zarephath, there was this widow woman. And when he asked her to give, her to give to him food, in verse 12, she says this. She says, I only have a little bit of meal in a barrel and only a little bit of oil in a cruise. But it is one of the most amazing statements that Elijah said back to her. In verse 14, he says, you have a barrel full of meal and you have a cruise full of oil. She says, I've just got a little bit of meal in a barrel. And he said, you got a barrel full of meal. She says, I just have a little bit of cruise and oil. He said, you got a whole bucket full of oil. And God honored his word of faith. And the Lord speaks this word to me that this is going to be a month of miracles for you. This is going to be a month where God releases his grace in every battle you're in. You're to stand strong. And you're to call those things that are not as though they were. You're not to speak the problem, but you're to speak the answer. The barrel, you've got a barrel full of money. You've got a barrel full of whatever you need to have a victory. The devil says you don't have enough, but God says you've got more than enough. In Jesus' name. Lord, meet every need for your glory and honor. And everyone said, Amen. You may be seated. Today, I want to share with you on five things you need to do in the next five days. Say that with me. Five things I need to do in the next five days. Now, you say, why five days? Well, five is the number of grace in the Bible. That's what it is. In the Bible, 
the word, Greek word paraclete, which is the word for the describing the work of the Holy Spirit, is mentioned five times. Four times is the word comforter. One is the word advocate. The number of significance in the Old Testament tabernacle that points to Christ, where it's 100 cubits long and 50 cubits wide and 20 cubits high, every one of those numbers are divisible by five noting that Jesus was God's mercy door to all mankind. There were five smooth stones that David used when he went against Goliath, indicating here is a little young boy against the giants of life, and God's mercy will bring victory every time. In Leviticus chapter 26, verse 8, it says, Five of you shall chase a thousand, and a hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight. Not five of anybody, but five of you that are redeemed and filled with the Holy Spirit. You're not like any other five. And you shall rise up and you shall taste, chase a thousand. A hundred of you will chase ten thousand. And grace means favor. If I'm poor and I have favor, it's called pity. If I'm sick and... I have favor, it's called compassion. But if I am a person that's unworthy, that favor is called grace. It's the grace of God. And May is the fifth month in our calendar. This is a month of God's grace. I've always looked at, uh, at May, and I even had posters printed uh, several years ago. Month is the, May is the month of miracles. And I never understood exactly why <clears throat> it was a month of miracles. But I'm beginning to understand it more and more because it's the month of grace. And tomorrow is the fifth day <clears throat> of the fifth month. And it is grace to the tenth power. Hallelujah. I want you to believe that God is going to do things that you're unworthy of, that you haven't earned and it's going to happen this week in the name of Jesus. And sometimes it's not what we do that ushers it in, but sometimes it's what we don't do that hinders the grace of God in our lives. And I want to share with you, thank you, I want to share with you five things that you need to do in the next five days. I want you to write them down. If you don't have a piece of paper, I want you to write them down on your hand. But I want you to write these down on the canvas of your imagination and your thinking. The first thing that you need to do is forgive everybody and love people like you've never been hurt before. One of the great cha uh, chapters in the Bible is in the, the book of Matthew, chapter 6. And in Matthew 6, it talks about the Lord's Prayer. In verses 14 and 15, it says, For if ye forgive men their trespasses or their sins, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now this includes fathers, mothers, sons, daughters. It, rem it uh, includes ex-marriage partners, employers, pastors. It includes everybody. Forgiveness is the one sin that Christians think they have the right to do, but you don't. In 1712, there was a fellow by the name of William Lynch. He was a slave owner, and he wrote a book, and that book was entitled, Let's Make a Slave. And in this, he told the dominating, humiliating, intimidating cruelty that brought distrust and uh, where it would be able, a slaveholder would be able to keep a human being in bondage as a slave. A part of that book talked about murdering, if necessary, in front of their family, in front of other slaves, and uh, murdering the most torturous type of murder through hanging. And this is where we get the term lynching. It came from this man. And some 200 years later, there were vigilante groups down in the south. And they would come and trying to keep 
blacks in place. They would lynch people and they would hang people. One of the great stories I ever read was about a man by the name of Lawrence Jones. He uh, had graduated from the University of Iowa. He was a black man. He had a sterling character. And he had read the book of Booker T. Washington. How Booker T. Washington went into uh, Alabama and he started a school. A school that educated blacks, helped them to get jobs, helped them to rise above uh, their, their poverty. And it so impressed him that uh, he was a minister by now and he felt like God was calling him to one of the poorest areas in America and he went to Mississippi about 30 miles out of Jackson and he started a school and uh, that school was called the, Pl the Pine Bluff School. And what they did, they began to uh, educate young black men and black women to get jobs. They taught them how to farm. They taught them how to be mechanics, how to be cooks, uh, how to get a job. And it was during this time that World War I was going on. And there was uh, rumors that the Germans had sent spies and they were trying to stir up the blacks down south uh, to revolt. And uh, they were joining the resistance uh, with the Germans. And one night while he was preaching, he was preaching that we need uh, to put, take on the armor. We need to rise up and fight. We need to stand boldly and come against every enemy that would oppose us. And of course, he's talking about the devil. And some of these men were listening on the outside of that church. And they interpreted that, the battle, take up the sword, the fight, as they were uh, collaborating with the Germans. And so they went and got others. Some of them were even with the Ku Klux Klan. And they came to that little church and they dragged Lawrence Jones out of that church. They put a, a rope around his neck. They took a cord of wood. They started it on fire. And they were going to burn him and hang him at the same time. And then before they did, they began to say, well, why don't you give us a speech? Why don't you talk a little bit? And so he began to speak for his life and for his cause. And he told them how he was raised in a Christian family and how he had gone to school and God had called him into the ministry. And he had come down here and he said, I even pawned my watch for a dollar sixty-five cents to help start this school. And I started with my pulpit was a, a stump. <clears throat> and he said, the, the people, prominent white people in this community have helped us. They gave us lumber. They gave me a, a, a pig to feed the students. Some a farmer gave me a cow. They've given us money. While he's talking, there was a Confederate veteran. He was an old man, and he sat there listening, and he said, uh, fellas, he said, I think we've got the wrong man here to hang. He's really doing a good work, and I think we ought to help him and not hang him. He said, he's mentioned some of these men I know. And come to, to think about it, I think they've told me that there was a fellow here trying to, to educate the blacks in our area. We need to help him. And he took his hat off, and he took an offering. And in that offering was $52.46, and they let him go. They asked him later, don't you hate those people? He said, I don't have time to hate them. I'm busy for what God has called me to do. And I'm not full of hate. I bless them in the name of Jesus. No other religion, Buddhism, Islam, has the word forgiveness. We're the only people whom God has called and has given us the power to forgive. You know, I, I read the story of Satchel Paige. He was uh, born around the first part of the century. He was a phenomenal um, pitcher, 
And in those days, uh, the blacks had not been integrated into the a Major League Baseball. It was all white. But he was so dominating as a pitcher. He, he was so powerful that the uh, Major League leaguers would go on bar barnstorming tours. I mean, fellows like Dizzy Dean, um, uh, Feller, Bob Feller, the Cleveland Indians. They, they would get teams and they would play uh, Satchel Paige's team. And one time he's, he's pitching and uh, in the stands they're making fun of him. Bases were loaded. The game was right on the line and they were making fun of him and he stopped and he turned to his uh, infield. He said, I want you all to just sit down. Then he called the outfield and he said, I want you to sit down right behind these bases. And then he struck every one of them out. Uh, and so finally, when he was 42 years of age, they uh, brought him into the major leagues up at Cleveland. He was disappointed because Jackie Robinson had been actually brought in first, but it was Satchel Paige that had really um, pioneered the way for the blacks in the major leagues. He, he had a pitch. It was called the hesitation pitch. And he threw it, and nobody could hit it. fact is, nobody could hit it, so they changed the rules and called it a balk. But it was a, a legal pitch that just nobody could hit. And they asked him, they said, oh, don't you feel bad? Don't, aren't you resentful because of the way you were... Uh, the prejudice and racism has been. And he made that statement that I shared with you. You have to love people like you've never been hurt. And that's what God has called us to do in the name of Jesus. And during this month, you've got to forgive your family. You've got to forgive those that have done you wrong. And you've got to believe God for his mercy in the name of Jesus. Secondly, you need to believe God for prosperity but don't act like it. What makes me so upset are people who get a little bit of money and they think they're better than everybody else. And you have to go get them delivered from looking at themselves in the mirrors. They get a little nicer car and they think that they're better than other people who don't have as nice a car or who don't live in the neighborhood that they live in or those kid, their kids don't go to the... the of the type of school that their kids go to. The Bible says in Proverbs 16, 18. Say Proverbs 16, 18. Say I love this scripture. It said pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Just as um, night follows day and uh, summer follows winter, a fall follows pride. You get someone that's arrogant, Someone that is so proudful, there's something's going to happen. You can bet the farm there's going to be a fall. The Bible is filled with stories of those type of people. There was Nebuchadnezzar who thought himself like a god, and he lost his mind, and for seven years he, he was in the fields like an animal. There is a story of Goliath, how he underestimated uh, David. What are you to send a little child to fight me. There is a story of Pharaoh, how he belittled the Jews, and the day came he was destroyed in the Red Sea. Some people, some people don't understand that when they allow pride to get a hold of them, it brings their own collapse. It attracts enemies that are eager to destroy you. Pride brings uh, overconfidence. It leaves one vulnerable to defeat. And it is an open door for the devil to come in, and it will even shorten your life, the rabbis taught. Now, in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 10, it talks about people that are poor. And it's very interesting because the Bible mentions poverty and poor people 197 times in the Bible. Not one time does it praise being poor. Not one time did... Uh, any of the uh, prophets, or, nor did Jesus pray for people to be poor. It is mentioned mostly in the book of Psalms and in the book of Proverbs. And it tells how to deal with poverty and how to come out of poverty. 
God's not into poverty. God is for setting people free from poverty. Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. And so the first anointing that God gave him was to break poverty. And in Leviticus chapter 19, you read as a farmer, a farmer was not allowed, it was against the Levitical law to reap all the corners of your field. You, were, uh, you had to let the corn grow there. You had to let the tomatoes grow there in that part of the garden so the poor could come in and they could glean in those areas, the widows, the orphans. And that's where Ruth came and she gleaned in the fields of Boaz and it was the Levitical law. Then you begin to read of the things that happened to people who made fun of poor people, who thought themselves better. In Proverbs chapter 10, verse 4, it says, He becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand. If you're lazy, you're going to be poor. In Proverbs chapter 3, uh, Proverbs 14, 31, it says, He that oppresseth the poor reproacheth his maker. If you want to get God against you, you stand against the poor. In Proverbs 17, 5, it says, If you mock the poor, you reproach God and he that is, is glad at calamity shall not be unpunished. It's real interesting when the plagues fell on the Egyptians. When it fell upon the Egyptians, there were a lot of non-Egyptians there, but who poked fun of the Jews, who mocked the Jews, and guess what? Every plague hit them too, including the death of their eldest son. If you make fun of other people, the calamity that they're in, the Bible teaches, will fall on you. You think you're better than the poor? That same curse that's been on them will come on your kids, on your family. And so one of the great things we have to understand that rich people benefit more by giving to the poor than the poor benefit by receiving gifts from the rich. Because when you begin to give to God, according to Proverbs 19, it says, He that gives to the poor lendeth unto God. Would you say that with me? He that giveth to the poor lends unto God. Now let's say you have a son. That son's on drugs. That son messes up. And finally you say, that's enough. You're out of this house. And so you throw him out of your house. And he's got a lot of issues. And... Now he's without a job and they've locked him up and he's out of jail now. Because of the things that have happened, you can't bring him back to your home. But that doesn't mean you don't want somebody to help him. That doesn't mean you want him to be under the heel of poverty and trouble all of his life. And someone steps up and he says, I'm going to help you, boy. I'm going to give him a job. So he gives him a job. Maybe it's over here at the Jiffy Lube place. And then someone else gives him an apartment and says, look, I'm going to help you. Someone else then promotes him and, and gives him a, a loan to help him get things, get on his feet. Well, you as a parent become obligated to those people. They've helped my boy. I'm going to get my oil changed over at Lift Jiffy Lube. I'm going to do work over there at that bank. That fellow helped me. I, I'm, I'm going to hire them to work on my air conditioning. And the Bible says that when you give to the poor, you lend unto God and God will repay. Many times people's lifestyles, their, the, the sins of their forefathers have brought a curse. The Bible says that curse will last for four generations. That's almost 200 years. But God says... God, God doesn't want them always to be under that curse. And for anyone that steps up and helps the poor, God is obligated to you. God owes you money. God owes you a return on what you did to help others. And so we as the people of God need to understand we have an obligation. We, I, I told Rachel, I said, Rachel, now you go to school and you work hard and you get blessed, and you get prosperous, but don't ever act like you got money. Don't act like you're a big shot, because we're just little shots.
trying to do something for big. She said, all right, Dad, I want to make money, and I won't act like it, but I do like nice shoes and expensive dresses. <laughs> oh, hallelujah to Jesus. Let me tell you the third thing that's very important is this. Are you listening today? Yeah. Pinch the person next to you and said, shut up and listen. The third thing that I want you to begin to do is save $3 a day and tithe on everything you make. You say, why save $3 a day? If you're 18 years of age and you begin to save $3 a day for the next 13 years to you're 31 years old, about the right age to get married, then if you leave that in um, an IRA account, and it will get the average interest. By the time you're 65, you'll have $1 million. Are you listening to me? There's no excuse for any high school graduate not to be a millionaire when you retire if you'll save $13 a day. Uh, excuse me, th thank you, thank you. <laughs> Just checking. <clears throat> $3 a day for 13 years. Now, if you save $3 a day until you're 65, you'll have $9 million. That's how much you will accumulate. And so a person that works at Ford, at UPS, a person who delivers newspapers can be a multimillionaire if you simply use the discipline that the Word of God teaches. And so, then the tithing releases the favor of God. It releases the blessing of God and it rebukes the devil. If a person doesn't tithe, their ability to achieve in life is based solely on their talents, on their efforts, on their strength, on their strong back. And the devil's out here trying to steal and to destroy. But when a person tithes, God steps up. And God empowers you to do more than what you can do. In the book of Genesis, chapter 8, uh, Deuteronomy 8, 18, it says, For it's the Lord that gives you power to make wealth. There is a supernatural anointing upon people that will give and help spread the gospel. I believe that those that have helped reach the poor in our city down through the Lord's kitchen absolutely will be blessed in a way that others who do not give will not be blessed in the name of Jesus. This, we have to understand this, that God empowers us to do greater things if we'll help spread the gospel and trust in Him. One of the great stories in the Bible is found in the book of Genesis, the 49th chapter, where it's the story of Joseph. Joseph uh, was uh, thrown in prison. He was falsely accused. He, he was accused by, by Potiphar's wife when he was innocent. But the Bible says the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. Do you know that word, the Lord was with Joseph, is actually the angel of the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. There are angels of prosperity. And some of the most oppressive situations you can ever be around is when you get around in those projects. We go down to one of the worst projects in the city of Louisville where more murders take place, and we give out backpacks. We gave out a little over 3,000 backpacks back to school, and I've stood down there. I've stood down there, and there was a large uh, Somalian group of immigrants that moved into there, and they had a tribal law. And if the police were going to arrest someone, they had to go to almost the head chief and talk to him. The, the police officer spoke this to me. One of those men, those Somalians, we're talking about the pirate people, he came down to the Lord's kitchen. And he got down at the Lord's kitchen, and he heard the gospel. He was Muslim. And he started coming there and washing dishes there at the Lord's kitchen. And when the power of the gospel begins to go, it breaks bondage. But here is, here is Joseph. Now he interprets the dream of Pharaoh. And Pharaoh 
He told him there'll be seven good years and there'll be seven bad years. But the bad years will devour the good years. And he said, well, what should we do? He said, save 20%. He says, if you'll save 20% during the good season, when the bad times come, you'll prosper even more during the bad times than when the good times came. And so he said, the person is to do that is to you, Joseph. And Joseph was raised up. This is the concept that Abraham taught Isaac and that Isaac taught Jacob. And that was you give God 10% and you save 10%. If a person will do that for seven years, they will rise higher just as Joseph rose higher than his brothers and they will be a millionaire, especially if they invested outside of the interest of a bank. Just even in the stock market and the average that the stock market has grown over the last 40 years, that kind of investment will turn a person into a millionaire. It's called the Joseph Principle. And so during this month, forgive everybody. Love everybody. Secondly, be prosperous, but don't act like it. Treat people with respect and help the poor. Thirdly, start saving your money and believe God for miracles to happen. Let me tell you the fourth thing. Get up an hour earlier each day this month. You get up early to pray. The Bible says in, in Isaiah chapter 50, and I will give you the tongue of the learned, that thou wouldest speak a, a word in season to them that are weary, and I will awaken you morning by morning to hear as the learned. That was a prophecy about Jesus. And the Bible says in Mark 135, and Jesus rose a great while before day. Day's six o'clock. Before day would be five o'clock. A great while before day would be four o'clock. He would rise and he would pray. And he would seek God. He would go to a mountain and God would speak to him. And God gave him the mind of the learned. So you rise up and you pray. You get God's direction. The Holy Spirit begins to direct you. You read the Bible. You plan. You plan for success. You plan to succeed. You, you exercise. You, you get yourself prepared to take the day for God. You know, it's very interesting. I was in Korea, and there are probably three or 400 morning prayer meetings. And they get in there at 5 o'clock and they begin to pray. And there was a man who came over to Dr. Cho's church. And he was the secretary of the Navy. And while he's praying at 5 o'clock in the morning, he had a vision. And in that vision, he saw the North Korean ships coming. They sunk several fishing boats. And they were invading a part of South Korea. He's praying and suddenly he has this vision. He gets up from the prayer meeting and he goes over to his office and he called his people. He said, God spoke to me today in prayer and we're going to have an invasion from the north. They contacted their, their, uh, uh, some of their warships. They put them in, in places, strategic places. And that day, the North Koreans, their ships came down and South Korea sunk two of their ships and uh, turned them away. It came through prayer. There was a lady, <clears throat> and uh, she was praying one morning. She would get up early to pray, and her husband worked on the rigs, the oil rigs. And while she was praying, the Lord spoke to her and said, Today the devil has a plan to kill your husband. And she saw it so plainly that while he was there changing some of those uh, oil bits and their drilling bits, that a part of the rig broke loose and fell and decapitated him. And so when he got ready to go, she said, don't go to work today. And she explained what she had seen. He said, well, I have to go to work. And so he went to work and he, he was thinking and pondering what his wife had described to him. And in the midst of the day, that exact situation came where he was to have stepped up and he said, I'm not going to do it says, my wife had a vision from God, and God spoke to her that somebody was going to get hurt, and I'm not going to do it. And so a fellow laughed at him. And he said, well, I'll do it. And he jumped up there, and that rig broke just as she saw it, and it decapitated him. It came through prayer. 
It came through planning your day and allowing the Holy Spirit to direct you and guide you in the name of Jesus. Now I want to tell you the fifth thing and the final thing that I want you to do. Everybody can do this. <clears throat> I want you to smile and let the Holy Ghost use you in the name of Jesus. Now one of the great scriptures in all the Bible is found in Proverbs 17, 22. I want you to raise your hand. Raise your hand, everyone. Say, that's my favorite scripture too. In Proverbs 17, 22, it says, A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a contrite spirit drieth the bone. And when you begin to, to look that up in a, a lexicon, it, it says this, The medicine is translated cure. A merry heart brings a cure. And a merry heart is translated as an expression on a face. In other words, it's smile. A merry heart is you smiling where you're showing your teeth. And it makes you a beacon. It makes you have a radiant countenance like a lighthouse in a depressed world. It attracts people to you. I talked to a fellow and he always smiled. He, he'd show his teeth and he'd smile. I said, man, you've got a you got a great smile. He said, you know, the Lord spoke to me. He said, when I was a young preacher, the Lord says, if you'll smile, your church will grow. And he said, I, I began to train myself to smile. He said, I, I was thinking I was smiling, but I wasn't smiling. And so I started just, just showing my teeth. And that way I know that I'm smiling. And so, but it's very interesting. It's very interesting. It attracts people when you smile. When you're pleasant, it, you become radiant. Uh, a salesperson who smiles uh, has his clients in his hands like melted butter. <laughs> a girl who smiles, she can have any boy she wants. I've seen some of the most homely girls have some of the most, you know, superhero guys. And I thought to myself, you know, what did that guy see in her? And then you get around him, and they're happy, and they're fun. And, and Catherine Kuhlman was one of the most homely women I ever saw as a minister, but she was, she was smiling, and, and she was beautiful. It is the joy and the beauty inside. You know, you have four layers. You've got your, your, your skin, you've got your flesh, you got your muscles, and you got your bones. The Bible says that a, a, a merry heart, it says it's a cure. It'll strengthen even your bones. It comes from your spirit. So that joy comes out, and it goes through your bones. Then it goes through your muscles. You become stronger. And then it gets into your flesh, and it gets into your skin. You radiate with the glory of God. And depression does the very opposite. It dries the bone. If you're a doctor or if you're a teacher, I want you to turn your hearing aid up and listen very carefully. It's very important and it's been proven. If you're optimistic and you're happy and you're smiling, then your patients and your students, they are able to learn better. They are able to, to receive the medicines better. The cure rate is better simply because they enter into an atmosphere where there is joy and there is a cure for everything that they're going through. And the opposite is true. If a person, a teacher is pessimistic, if a doctor or someone in the medical field is gloomy and they've got a, 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 a frown on their face, the people are less likely to respond in the way that you would have them to respond. And so we smile. And we smile, it's like a flashlight comes on in a dark room. And people become attracted to you. And it allows the Holy Spirit to move through you and to flow through you in the name of Jesus. <clears throat> you know, I was, I was uh, with uh, this, this fellow, and I met him. He was, he was from China. Came from a very wealthy family in China. And I, I got talking to him, and he had gone to school over here at, at Ohio State, and he said it was so cold that he transferred down to the University of Louisville, uh, University of Kentucky. 
I said, oh, I'm a big Kentucky fan. And uh, you know how much I love Kentucky here in this church. And I said, oh, yeah, I'm a big UK fan. He said, you are? I said, oh, yeah. And I knew the Holy Spirit wanted me to talk to him. And so I asked God to forgive me later for that uh, little while. <laughs> and so we got talking. And, and uh, I said, well, what do you do? He says, well, I've, uh, my family uh, has put me here so that I can help bring investors over here. And we also, we uh, help their kids get into schools. I have a partner, and, and this partner was a lady. She was a spirit-filled lady from Columbus, uh, Georgia. And uh, we were talking, and they told me how one student, uh, they put him down to the school in Texas, and, and the dad wanted to buy him a Rolls Royce so he could have something to run around in while he was going to school. I mean, these, this is the type. And, uh, and so... While we're talking and we're on a plane, I, I felt impressed to pray for him to receive the baptism in the Holy Ghost. He said that he accepted Christ, but he had heard of speaking in tongues. He said, my, my partner here, my business par partner, she speaks in tongues, but I don't. I said, well, I believe God has brought me here to pray for you. And so he, I said, lift your hands up. And right there on a plane... Next to an attorney, he lifts his hands up, and he received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And I, come on, hallelujah. And I, I said to him, I hope you weren't speaking Chinese. Uh, but uh, he said, no, it was tongues. I was speaking tongues. And so when we got off the plane, he said, uh, he said to me, so where are you staying? I said, well, I'm, I'm going to catch a flight out in the morning. I'm just going to get a hotel. He said, he said, well, here, I'll drive you. And so he took me, and, and I got in his car, and I said, man, I've never been in a car like this. What kind is it? It was a Ferrari. And, and he began to drive so fast. Don't ever ride with Chinese without putting your seatbelt on extra. T I bet he drove 90 miles an hour. And I said, ooh, this car really drives good, doesn't it? Hallelujah. But what is it? It's the, the, a merry heart. It doeth good like a medicine, and it opens the door for the Holy Spirit to flow through you. Never be embarrassed of the power of God. Never be embarrassed to pray for people to be healed and delivered and set free in Jesus' name. Come on, can I hear an amen today? Hallelujah. Oh, praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. One time I, I was on an airplane, and I got talking to this fellow, and I was laughing and and then I, uh, I, I told him what I did. And I began to pray for him. And uh, this fellow began to cry. And the tears welled up. And, and he was crying. I started crying. And, uh, and he, was, uh, he owned a professional sports team. And he was on the, the board of this, uh, of the whole thing. The whole uh, U.S., I won't tell you what it is. Uh, sports program, and when he got through and we got ready to go, he said, you know, uh, we're going to open up a, a, another franchise in Nashville. How would you like to be a partner uh, and be on that professional team? And I thought to myself, you know, isn't that amazing how that would open that door? He thought I had a lot of money. And uh, <clears throat> I said, well, I'll, I'll pray about it. And, uh, but it is what opportunities that will happen if a person will simply... Be joyful and let the Holy Spirit flow through their lives. Nothing will be impossible to you in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. This is a month of mercy. This is a month of God's grace. This is a month for your family to be blessed. This is something for uh, a month that unusual things are going to happen that you don't even deserve for them to happen for your children, for your marriage and your home. Do something good for your wife. Uh, ladies, go buy your husband something. Buy him socks. All guys, all guys need socks. Hallelujah to Jesus. Praise God. I want to pray today. I feel the anointing of the Holy Ghost here. Hallelujah to Jesus. Hallelujah to Jesus. There's a family that came here today and you're broken. There's things that have happened in your relationship and 
in your home and in your family. And you've come to church today. You've come to see what God would do for you. And God brought you here. And God's grace is sufficient to heal every difficult thing you've gone through. You think, well, I can't get over this. Yes, you can. Through God's help in Jesus' name. There, there's someone here you're facing a, a, a unbelievable financial situation to the point that you've almost given up. God says, don't give up. That there is light at the end of the tunnel. God's going to make a way for you. If you're here and you're out of fellowship with God, this is the time to make those things right. I want us all to stand. Everybody's standing. Hallelujah. I want a representative of every family to come right down here to the front. Maybe your whole family would like to come. But I want someone from every family to come down here. And as you come, I want us to pray this prayer together. Say, Lord Jesus, you have a plan for my life. And devil, you're not included in that plan. Now take your hands off my life. Take your hands off my home. Off my family members. In the name of Jesus, I'm walking under the grace of God. This is a month of miracles. This is a month of God's mercy. In Jesus' name. Now with every head bowed, if you're not right with God, and sometimes we can allow things to get into our life that hinder us, hinders us, and prevents God from fulfilling what He wants to do in us. And if you're here and you're in that situation, I just want you to raise your hand so I, I, I just know where you are and I want to pray for you. Just slip your hand up right now. Yes. Yes. Are there others? Yes, 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 yes. I want to... To continue this prayer so Lord Jesus forgive me of every sin live in my life may I not only be pure but may I be squeaky clean may I hear your voice and Lord I will do what you've called me to do I want you to join hands with people on either side of you and I want you to pray for them like you'd like somebody to pray for you right now I just want you to pray in your own words Father, in the name of Jesus, we bless those on either side of us today. I bless you with the power of the Holy Spirit. May God speak to you. May God direct you. May God guide you. May God open up the right doors and may He close the wrong doors in Jesus' name. May God give you direction. Direction for this week. May God show you the right key and the, and the right door to go through to bring success and peace and blessings to you and your family in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, be, bind every demon off of them. Bind every attack off their life. Father, in the name of Jesus, I bind, I come against every devil, every demon, every power, every principality. I break it off of you in the name of Jesus Christ. Devil, come out of that family. Take your hands off their lives in Jesus' name. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. While you're joining hands there, if you have your prayer language, begin to pray for them in your prayer language. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the healing in our lives. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Now I want everyone to pray with me. Say, Lord Jesus, take out of me any hurts and bruises, any unforgiveness. Get it out of my life. Lord, I don't want to hold any grudges, any hurts towards anybody. I bless my enemies, those that have hurt me, those that have stolen from me. I release it to you. And I know you will repay me. In the name of Jesus, fill me with your love. Fill me with your peace. Now take both hands and lay it right here on your chest. I rebuke cancer, disease, sickness, weakness. I command it to come out of you in the name of Jesus. You'll not have arthritis. 
You'll not have trouble with your back and your joints and your knees. You'll live longer than grandpa lived. You'll outlive your mama and your daddy. In Jesus' name, I rebuke cancer, diabetes, heart disease, generational curses. Come out in the name of Jesus Christ. Now lift your right hand to the Lord. Say in Jesus' name, the hand of God's on me. I'm prosperous. My barrel is full. I have more than enough because God's meeting my needs according to His riches, not my riches, not by our bankrupt government, but by the riches of heaven in Jesus' name. Now let's pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's give the Lord a great big praise for that. Hallelujah. 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 Generational curses. I break it in the name of Jesus Christ. May there be a change that takes place for the glory of the Lord. In Jesus' name. Could the earth have been created in just seven days? And where did man come from? Or how old is the earth? Don't miss the Genesis debate at Evangel World Prayer Center June 7th at 5 p.m. All seats are free and doors open at 4 p.m. Plus, you'll have a chance to ask your questions. Defend your belief at the Genesis debate Sunday, June 7th at 5 p.m. at the Evangel World Prayer Center. For more information, visit worldprayercenter.org. For some, college will deliver a career. But for you, it's always been about a calling. Discover your path to successful ministry and fulfill your call at Evangel Christian College. We offer a wide range of classes for ministry-minded individuals just like you. With night and weekend classes available and financial aid for those who qualify, Evangel Christian College is your perfect opportunity to grow. You know your call. Now make the call. It'll help you reach your goals. Evangel Christian College. Realize your call. He's the one that does the clothing. He goes, thank God we've got a pastor who prays the Lord. If I'm an overachiever, I begin to run Elisha with the song. gave the war of God. Anytime. And be a man of God. And they would just, oh, I just want you set free. Christ from the dead lives no, in. No, that this preacher told you the truth. I would suggest align yourself with CGIA and let's go forth and take our communities for Christ. God will direct you. The Bible says, be ye not unwise, but understanding. Understand what the will of the Lord is. If we will seek Him, God will show us how to be blessed. God will break off of us whatever the devil has put on us in Jesus' name. Ask and ye shall receive. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. There's power in us to bring healing and miracles and signs and wonders in the name of Jesus. Nothing shall be impossible to us. Nothing shall be withheld from us because we are walking uprightly before the Lord. I break generational curses. I break it in the name of Jesus Christ. May there be a change that takes place for the glory of the Lord. In Jesus' name.